Like so many of us in the West, I have been ruminating on our failed exit from Afghanistan. It's been nothing short of a disaster. I'm sure you've been following the news. We've left people behind, and now the Taliban control the region. But I'm not educated in military matters. I'm, I'm not educated in foreign policy. Uh, I'm ignorant when it comes to these issues, but I have the common sense to see that this was a failure. So I want to learn a bit more, and I think hopefully you want to learn a bit more too. So today I'm speaking to a former Navy SEAL named Carl Higby. He's a host of his own show on Newsmax, and he's written a few books on his own you know, time in the military. He was part of Operation Iraqi, I think Iraqi Freedom is what it was called. Uh, and he played a role in capturing a man who was the most wanted man in the Middle East at the time, the Butcher of Fallujah. So this guy knows what he's talking about. Uh, and I hope to get some insight from him on what's going on in the Middle East, where we're going, and how we could have done things differently. My name is Angelo Sidoro, and this is Cancel This. Yeah, so I, I talked about this in my intro, but, you know, I, I'm a civilian, so my understanding of the military and the intricacies are, are limited. But I think, like most people, I can recognize that everything that just happened in Afghanistan was a major, major mess up. Um, mm. And before we get to that, I was wondering whether you can sort of give me an idea of your background. I mean, I know you were a Navy SEAL, you, you served. Um, could you give me an idea of why you joined the military? Uh, well, so I always wanted to be a SEAL since I was about four years old. My mom bought me a, a book about it and was like, oh, here's something for this kid to read or, or like or something. So anyway, long story short is after 9-11 and then we started putting troops on the ground, I dropped out of college and joined the military and said, you knock down buildings in my country. I'm going to come to yours and knock down all of your buildings. And um, it was a it was one of those things where. I felt like I need like it was a hole in my life that i needed to do i needed to um you know and not just goes beyond serving my country it was it it started off as and i'll be honest like it was it was a bit of a revenge thing um i was very angry about what happened because i lost a lot of friends in that um or friends parents and it was an attack on sovereign soil that we hadn't seen before and i wanted to do my part to make sure that we told them to never do it again so um, that's how it started. But, you know, it, it became as I went through my service, I mean, I was 20 years old when I joined, uh, when I went through the service of it, I, I started to learn what I was actually fighting for the constitution, the values, you and I were talking a little bit offline about, you know, the difference in the, in the need for freedom in this, in this culture. I mean, like America is it, there's, if, if America loses its freedoms, there's nowhere to go. I mean, it's, it's you're not going to move to Sudan, you know? It's it, we are the we are the the last best hope of of the free exercise of free thought and exchange of ideas and um, I think uh, you know it, and it took getting shot at for me to really appreciate how good we have I mean keep in mind we live in a society so good today that people invent stuff to be mad about like they <laughs> invent this trend they do I mean like we you know we live in the only culture and the only society in the in the history of the world where the primary health concern among poor people is having too much to eat obesity so it's like you know when you when you go overseas and i've seen 60 plus countries most of which are not places you'd act, take your family on vacation um you appreciate that and um through through that time i was actually in 2009 jumping back to your original question 2009 I was um, in charge of the, you know, a lot of the airstrikes and the, the, the air positions and the air coverage for us withdrawing from Iraq. Um, and we saw the same thing that happened there. Only it was gr drastically accelerated in Afghanistan. But I saw a poorly executed plan. It was a bad plan to begin with. And then the execution was even worse uh, by Barack Obama to get people the heck out of that country so fast for political expedience. The military's job, look, we start. We, we went in there. We started the war for the right reasons, with the right intent. But somewhere along the line, you know, back, you know, right at the tail end of Bush Cheney, we started nation building. And it's like, guys, dude, our job as military members, as soldiers, is to put bullets in bad guys. We're not here to build schools or hand out water or feel good campaigns or flyers and th like. Let us kill bad guys and break things. And when you take a soldier and make him be a diplomat. You've removed him from his who he is. People j join the military because that's who they are, and that's what they did. And you're like, look, you want to you want to be diplomatic? 
great, sweet, send diplomats. But if your diplomats aren't able to accomplish what they need to, need to do because it's too violent, it's because you didn't let the soldiers do their job first. And we saw this huge failure in Iraq. We had the creation of ISIS shortly afterwards. And everybody said, oh, my God, we're, we're going to learn from this, and it will never do it again. And here we are a couple of years later, we did the same damn thing in Afghanistan. Yeah, you know, it's sort of fascinating because that region for like history buffs has always been conflicted. Mm-hmm. It's always been a region that is is kind of impossible to govern just because it's so fractured and balkanized. And I think a lot of us, you know, I'm a, I'm a younger guy, so I, I was growing up um, during those years when we were at war. It's sort of, you know, it, it sort of made us confused at, at some point as to what are we doing here? Like, why are, why is this happening? Right. Like, what is, what is the end of this and and what does that mean and you know you look at some of these these figures like i believe and correct me if, if i'm wrong you were involved in the operation that captured the butcher of fallujah who at the time yes. was probably the most wanted man in the middle east he he was a horrible 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 human being right. um and that is someone who should not be free, who should not be allowed to basically, he was terrorizing his own people, if I'm not mistaken. Let alone responsible for killing hundreds of Americans. I mean, he was directly responsible for the intelligence and the the operations that killed hundreds of Americans. Yeah, so so the guy was a monster. I think, you know, doing that, getting rid of that guy, it's a net positive. No one could could disagree with that. But then when it gets into Mm -hmm. nation building, you get into the situation we had in Afghanistan where their government lasted like a day after we left. It was sort of porcelain, right? So so you you join the military, um, you're a Navy SEAL, you so you served in Iraq? Iraq. Never went to Afghanistan, but I did Iraq twice. So, you know, again, obviously it would take hours to hear about what it was like entirely, but what was that like as, you know, a 20 something year old guy from, I think you said you're from Connecticut going over there and just dealing with war. I mean, what was that like? I, I will say I, me and the people I served with are uniquely suited for that field. Um, I don't, I'm very fortunate. I don't have any bad dreams or, or, long you know I'm, I'm able to function in society i own a business i i you know obviously i'm on tv i'm able to be a a, a a contributing part of society a lot of guys weren't so lucky they had traumatic experiences i mean and and can't come home and deal with it and for me it was it was always about making sure that the country that i love was never going to have to experience the brutality that they're seeing in that country because you know you can you can go overseas and you can fight you know, a, a half footed war. And the issue is, is, and we did this in Iraq and we did this in Afghanistan. Like we, you, but when you engage in a war, you can't just say, okay, we're done. We win. Like the enemy gets a say in that. And no, nobody listened to the troops on the ground. This happened in Iraq and it definitely happened in Afghanistan. We said, look guys, we're, the war's not over. Like the bad guy's still here. And they're saying, Oh no, 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 no. Don't, don't, shh, don't talk about that. That's, that, that that's irrelevant. And, so to get us out of Iraq, what the Obama administration did was they would cut funding to things like, and, and this would be refuted by anybody who has the opposing political opinion, but I was on the ground and I, I saw this and talked to the people. They'd say, oh, we're cutting the funding to this helicopter squadron. Well, that funding comes out of their repair budget. So now you have grounded helicopters and it's like, okay, well now instead of flying arbitrary number, 50 missions a day, we're only flying 10 because we don't have enough helicopters because the, the mission support is down. They've de- defunded our manning, so they've sent more military people home. We can't physically put 50 missions a day. And then Barack Obama would go on TV and be like, we're standing down the missions because there's no need anymore. No, you're standing down the missions because the helicopters can't fly because they're not repaired properly because they don't have the money. I mean, And then they, they create this aura that, that we've somehow won the war everything's fine and then the second we leave everything goes to hell yeah and and it goes back to the point of what is a war i mean again historically you invade a place you either invade it to annex it and we didn't annex anything right like it's not like we own that property now or it's uh, iraq isn't a a state so so to what end was it for and I, i think afghanistan is sort of a more shocking example now because you know trump comes in and his foreign policy 
despite everyone saying that he was going to, you know, ca cause World War Three and all, all that BS, um, he doesn't like war, as far as I can tell. Like, he, he, he didn't like right. war. He didn't, he, he thought it was not tenable to just invade countries. He was not willing, he was not unwilling to go there, but it was the last resort. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, I think he's been pretty vocal about it for years. He's gone, you got Biden now, and this Afghanistan thing is is it shocked the world i mean the images are shocking and you've been vocal right. about it and i guess my question is and it's a broad question what's wrong here like what like how do they mess this up because it's such a colossal mess up i mean it it starts by simply them not listening to the dudes on the ground i mean that's what it comes down to is you know, we now know that there were those classified State Department um, cables that came out that was warning this in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. Now, you know, in June of 2021, like, hey, don't do this. We're not ready. Now we saw the testimony of even the, like Millie's a turd or General Millie's a complete yeah. turd. And he is. This guy, I mean, first off, he's like a symptom of the, the problems in the military, but he even said, like, I recommended keeping 2,500 troops. But Obama, or, uh, Biden turns around and says, oh, no, I don't know. Nobody ever told me that. It's like, I mean, maybe legitimately like a dude forgot. But um, at the end of the day, um, there were people. And the same thing happened in Iraq. Like, we were sitting there banging on the CIA's door saying, you know, it's not ready to leave. And at some point, we get in there. And when you, this is when you inject politics, and a lot of the generals are basically politicians anyway. So I don't really care for generals that much, um, with notable exceptions. But the problem is, is you, the the the, the American people lose a, the political will willpower to like after after nine eleven, people were like, we, I mean, we stood united. There was an American flag on every door in America. Now it's only on Republicans' doors. Because it's somehow become a politically charged thing. We don't think it is, but the left does. And you have um, an entire group of people in America that are very, very loud. They're, they might be a minority, but they're very, very loud. So they seem like a majority that scream anti-war. Oh, my God, we're wasting money and killing people. And, blah. you know, they, they go on about these talking points and make any current administration feel like we've lost the will to fight. The problem is, is you have a bunch of guys like me that are in country and willing to fight. Let us go take the leash off the dogs of war and let us do our thing. And we could have solved that problem in a month. You give me the resources, you give me I mean, the, all the resources of the U.S. military, we can put a, a missile in someone's bedroom door by a push of a button in under 20 minutes, basically anywhere in the world. Don't tell me we can't do something, all right? We have a footprints and a flag on the moon using slide rulers in the 60s, okay? We can do literally anything we want for for the greater good of the world and because when america's on top everybody's better off trust me and you have this political politically expedient idiots in the in the, in the administration in the military that are think that they can like reason with a war war is kill or be killed and this enemy is sworn sworn in their basic ideology to kill Anybody who doesn't believe it, and then we're talking about the extremists here, though, um, the, the, like the Taliban and, and Al Qaeda and, and, and ISIS and stuff like that. These guys, they are not going to stop at anything, and they won't. They they don't need to do it tomorrow. That's the biggest thing they didn't understand. Like this Al Qaeda group that were or Al Qaeda K or whatever they call it now, they come up with a new name every time, and they were willing to wait in caves for twenty years. Until we left. And then they came out and they're like, all right, cool. We're taking the country back. And they did it in like less time than it took us to get to the moon. Yeah. And and it, and it makes the West look weak. I mean, look, I'm in Canada. Uh, Canadians hate admitting it, but we're your little brother, right? Like what America does, we do. And we were there. We had, you know, peacekeepers. And when when the announcement came, I mean, Trudeau was too busy campaigning we also, you know, yeah. we're, we're part of uh, part of this this political expediency that abandoned people there. I mean, not to mention, I mean, in your case, you had Americans that were abandoned, but you also had these mm -hmm. interpreters 
who like risked their lives to like basically side with us. They're, they're frankly defecting from their own people to like side with us. And we just like ditched them there. And what happens to yeah. those guys? I mean, the Taliban yeah. is a ruthless warrior. It's, it's, and, right. and, and at the end of the day, it, it was kind of embarrassing as a Westerner to see like, wow, like we're, you know, we're the strongest military in human history. And like, we lost this country this in under how, yeah, yeah it's, it's just sort of and and you see that happen and you see china smiling at that obviously because now their morale is is boosted so i guess one of the the confusing things i wanted to ask you is even if it is politically expedient why didn't we get our people and i say our people as the west why didn't we get our people out first? Why didn't we disband our weapons and or destroy them? Like why? It just feels like everything was done backwards. This is such a good question. I have no idea why we didn't. I can tell you a million reasons or times. I mean, but I, we literally destroyed. Like we piled up a bunch of Humvees over in Iraq and dropped air support on you know airstrikes on them so they wouldn't go into the bad guys' hands. Um, they were the, the Biden administration, and I don't think Biden is actually in control of anything. I think the, the so I'll call it the Biden administration. They wanted to get out of there so bad so they could have the talking point. And it was and they were willing to do it at any cost. And now you got like the Taliban flying helicopters around. I mean, it, it is. And the, the most concerning thing, too, which is which is not a lot of people are talking about is like China just rolled in there and took over a trillion dollar lithium mine. We did none of that. Like we spent all the political, all the human capital, all the financial capital, all the resources and time and effort and, you know, going to the United Nations and, and, and leading this charge. And we got nothing out of it. We're not even any safer now than we were before we went in. So you know, like I would and, and Trump got a lot of a uh, lot of chagrin about this, which is take the oil like yes if i was in iraq like securing the country rebuilding it i would negotiate the terms of our you know our our or our, our whatever you know like give, giving us something in, in in return and that would have been the oil i, I totally agree same thing in afghanistan oh you have a trillion dollar lithium mine Wait, what's the most expensive part of alternative energy right now storing it what does lithium do we use it for batteries hey cool we're taking that trillion dollar lithium mine you're welcome like you're saying these these things to me it just seems like common sense which is why it's weird because i'm a citizen i don't i didn't go to military school i'm not you know i'm not like these generals but yeah if you're in this country and it has resources you would want to be able to extract that people are dying there people are so so yeah i mean for me and i i don't know if you would agree china is like the most significant geopolitical threat now oh 100 percent. look angelo i have no like i don't even have a college degree OK, I barely squeaked my way through through high school. All right. I can figure this out. All right. I, if, if I can figure this out, it should be so easy for the people with the master's degrees and the years of foreign policy and government service and this. And that. These people, the fact that they can't figure this out is just baffling to me. I mean, this is like cataclysmically stupid. Yeah. And, and, and it's. I mean, it goes back to the images as well. Like I'm seeing these videos where these guys are walking around in this armory and they're just playing with our guns, basically, and our taxpayer-funded military. Right. I mean, I know they have the helicopters. I've heard some people say, look, those things are going to break down eventually, and they're not going to know how to fix them. But it doesn't negate the fact that it, you have all these things that are so simple, not to mention the most important fact, which is that we left people yeah. there. We, we abandoned people. Right. And now the message in the ethos of, of the West and people that are willing to go there is, hey, there's a solid chance we might ditch you. And, and, right. and I mean, but that yeah. is the key. I mean, the, the problem is, is like, so we had this airstrike where Biden was like, oh, my God, we killed those bad guys that were doing suicide bombing. And it turns out we killed an aid worker and a bunch of kids. And the reason that happened is, one, because our military was so hastily getting out of the, the area that we were ditching people left and right. And we weren't consulting our ground forces. Like I said, they, they never consulted anybody on the ground to figure out what was going on. And they did this airstrike. I guarantee you, they just like they just closed their eyes and threw a dart at the board. We're like, we're gonna hit this, hit this thing and say that it was a bad guy. And our our only problem was, or I should say, our only avenue to to make this less bad was using the sources on the ground. And like you just said, we basically burned all the sources. 
everybody who helped us, who we promised all these things. I mean, like, look, there was a, there was an interpreter that got Joe Biden out of Afghanistan when his helicopter was forced to land under duress like, I don't know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever it was. And they left that guy there. Joe Biden left the guy that saved his life in Afghanistan to fend for himself when he'd given 20 years of service to the U.S. government on behalf of our thing. We made him all these promises. And the guy that saved the current president of the United States' life was left in a... I mean, how dumb are these people? Yeah. And and, and this whole notion that, well, conservatives don't care about immigrants or whatever, it's like, look, that guy who served 20 years to, to, for us... Like, let's bring him here. That guy is clearly, clearly cares about America. He sided with us. He's clearly our guy. So I, I don't understand, you know, there's so much virtue signaling on the left about how progressive they are and everything. It's like, well, they abandoned these people. And it, it just makes me wonder what the future looks like. Because now, okay, we're out of, we're out of Afghanistan. We lost people there. We don't even have the interpreters out. China's already gone in and made all sorts of deals. What is the future of of the American military? I mean, there's this notion that, you know, maybe, you know, we're Rome and we are just deteriorating and we're no longer going to be. I keep saying we, but I'm Canadian, but tough shit. We're basically. You, you can be honorary American. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go maybe you can, <laughs> you can smuggle me over. Um, but yeah, exactly. what happens? Like, is this, are we just deteriorating? Is that, is this just the end of, 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 you know, us basically dominating and, and protecting the world? No. Um, I mean, look, we have, you know, a dozen carrier battle groups out there that can deliver hundreds of planes and their ordnance 20 times over at any time, anywhere around the world with, you know, extreme precision. And, you know what? You you haven't lost. We've lost the political will to fight anything, as I'm sure we've burned a ton of bridges. But I can guarantee you that, you know, this is America is is unique among the superpowers. Like you have Russia, which has basically Putin has been there for what twenty something thirty years, and then you have China, which is a lifetime presidency. Xi. And America is really the only one that practices of the superpowers that practices this 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 turnover of presidencies. Um, and obviously you have our allies of ours that do, you know, have elections and things like that. But I'm, t I'm talking about like the, the mega clash in the world is going to be between China, America, and Russia. That's what it's going to be. Um, you know, other, our, our allies will jump in, but that, that's what's, what, it, what it's going to be. And they're willing to wait it out. They're willing to do their thing. Um, but the, the American warfighter has not lost the will to fight. I mean, I actually tried to get on a plane and go over to Afghanistan and the state department would not let us in. Um, and we had an Avenue through some con contracting services and they were like, there's no way the state department is letting you guys into the country. So uh, the will to fight is there. When we get an administration like a Trump administration, and I believe he's going to run again, um, he will restore our respect on the national stage. And that's the irony is that the democratic party has said basically like, Oh, okay. Yeah. We're restoring America's respect on the national. Side. Nobody respects us right now, which is that and everybody, some, some were afraid of us, but many respected us under Trump. And when that comes back, I think it'll be a lot easier to win wars, but until we do, I mean, we are in deep, deep, deep trouble. Yeah. Well, again, under Trump, you didn't have people literally hanging off of airplanes as they take off. I mean, what does right. that tell you in terms of the desperation of these people? And, and it's just, it's so immoral at the end of the day. So I, I guess you're right. I mean, I guess I want to ask about the uh, Miley. Like, the, I don't understand the stereotype in America, at least the stereotype in the zeitgeist, is that the general is always like the Republican guy. The general is always the conservative figure. And then you have like this guy saying that he wants to learn about like white rage. And he's always he's, he's more concerned about like the Proud Boys than he is about actual like violent terrorism or, or defense. Like how does how does a guy like that get put in charge? It just baffles me. You know, I, I, I've written three books and, you know, no big words. So they're easy reads and I recommend everybody reads them. But the first one was Battle on the Home Front. And I talk about the military promotion system in there and how turds get elevated to extreme positions simply on the fact that they are promoted out of positions instead of firing them. Um, 
And no, I'm serious. It, you're, you're laughing, but it's crazy. The, the, the U.S. military is the DMV with nuclear subjects. <laughs> it, it is it – is, I'm telling you, it is just like – like cosmic stupidity at some of the other ranks. And the problem with the system, the military system, is you cannot question authority. All right. You, these guys get promoted and they're like, oh, I have a plan. And everybody below them is like, oh, yeah, like lap dogs. Like, this is a great plan. And you're sitting there and you're like, nobody criticized this at any level. When nobody was like, I mean, ironically, the only guy, the only guy who's being held accountable, who's in jail right now for Afghanistan is the one guy that called for accountability on Afghanistan. He had nothing to do with the operations of it. He just wanted accountability and they threw him in jail for it. He's a political prisoner. So there is no question. And this is like proves my point. There's no questioning the upper ranks, no matter how dumb the idea is. If you're a lower rank guy that sees a problem with this, you don't dare raise your hand because what do they do? They throw you in the brig like they did with Lieutenant Colonel Scheller. So it's that's know, how we get screwed up. It's like a weird upwards mobility of like mediocrity. Uh, it, it's it's strange. Oh, it, it, totally. So, so then how totally. how do you fix that? I mean, I understand you know soldiers need to follow orders, right? You don't want like sure. opinionated soldiers, but I mean now you also have this thing where a lot of a lot of guys I've heard of that I've seen are leaving because they don't want to get vaccinated, or I mean I'm seeing that happen mm -hmm. here. How do you question authority? Like, can you can you even question authority in the military? Like, how do you fix this problem? No, and there's you know this is it's it's quite a bit dated, but it's entirely applicable across the board right now. There was an article written in the Atlantic, and I don't read a lot of the Atlantic, trust me. But the there was an article written in the Atlantic from I think it was like fifteen or twenty years ago, and it was said why it was called why our best officers are leaving. And it talks about exactly what you said, the upward mobility of mediocrity. It's like you all you have to do is play the game. Doesn't matter how good you, your job is, like meritocracy is out the window uh, in the military. You, I mean, there are some guys that make rank that are good dudes and stuff. But as soon as they turn the corner and become a senior person, senior enlisted, senior officer, they have no choice but to, among their peers, become exactly what they hated when they were in prior in rank to it's like a self-serving prophecy and you know i would encourage everybody listening to go read that article if they want to understand this it's it's a little bit lengthy it's about 15 20 pages but it, it it talks about a guy who you know went to west point and like interviewed all these people guys who are getting out guys who have gotten out and guys that are still in and and kind of charted their their morale you know, on the, you know, how much their fund meter was pegged as they go through their careers. And he found out that nobody in the military, nobody makes rank with very rare exceptions because of something they did that was great. They just make it because like all you have to do in the military to make like Oh five. Okay. The fifth highest rank, which Lieutenant Colonel Scheller was, you're eligible to be the commanding officer of an entire unit. All you have to do is not kill anyone, basically. Like, you don't have to do anything exemplary to make that rank. When you make Colonel, like, yeah, you might have to put some bullets in your eval about, like, well, I stood up this program and I wrote this PowerPoint that presented to the general and then was then used on, you know, the national strategy of the Pentagon, blah, blah, blah. But other than that, like, you, you how you, it, you'd be shocked how little you have to do right. To make rank. And that said, great men and women in the military, phenomenal men and women that are willing to die for this country. However, you have a bunch of people being, and although, not all, most of those good people, they do their time. I did nine years. They do their time. They're like, I can't take this anymore. I'm out. And the good dudes leave and the turds stay. And that's what Millie is. He was the, 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 the retention turd. <laughs> the longest lasting turd. Um, it is like the one that just won't flush. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So last question. Do you think, I can't wait to see the headline of the piece you write on this. <laughs> retention the retention turd. turd. <laughs> yeah. Um, here, here's a, here's a last question. Do you think, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's again, this notion out there that all we do is pick a random country and invade it. Do you think Biden is going to launch another war somewhere? Do you think it's Syria or something? Do, do you think we're going to just pick another country to do this all over again in? Well, I don't think Biden is actually doing anything si well, other than uh, sipping Metamucil and having three naps a day. But the, puppeteers. Um, the administration. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I, I see. Here's the problem is I don't see them avoiding one with the way Afghanistan is devolving now. Is Afghanistan a threat today? No. 
Um, but will they garner enough? I mean, look, they're they're working with China. China wants nothing more than to properly fund a crazy radical group that's willing to attack America. Because in China's like, oh, we didn't do that. You know, you don't think for a minute that China's not hoping that or enabling. Let's say I'd even I'd go so far to accusing them of enabling and even potentially helping them plan an attack on America. It's not today. It's not tomorrow. But six months from now, a year from now. I mean, like these are things we got to be concerned about. And I don't think Biden has or the administration has a choice whether or not to go back in there. That's that's the really scary thing is we're going to be forced to start from square one, re-recruit all sources, redeploy all materials. And now we're fighting it's just like the Cold War. You've seen Charlie Wilson's war. The Taliban, we arm the Taliban to help keep Russia out of Afghanistan. And here we are getting shot with the guns that we paid for and we trained them how to use, you know, 40 years later. This is like the cycle of idiocy, and this is the people in government. I mean, Biden has been wrong. He's been in government so long. He served in the U.S. Senate with people who were born around the same time that the light bulb was invented. <laughs> that's how old this dude is. He served with people who were born in the late 1800s, okay? That's when. That's how long he's, he's been in there for half a century, and he's been wrong every time. Like, name me one foreign policy that he's been on the right side of. Yeah. It's it's uh, incredible times we live in, and uh, we're no better yeah. up here. I feel a sense of camaraderie with Americans now because we both have awful leaders. So I, I you know, we share we share in the pain together. That being said, I still want you to smuggle me down there somehow. So we'll we'll figure that okay. out. Right. But Carl, well, if you go, if you take a boat all the way around and come up the southern border, open arms. Exactly, and they, uh, you know, there's no <laughs> there's no horses now, so I can just. Uh, Waltz on through. Just I've been free stuff. Yeah, yeah you get to... I've been told I look a little Mexican anyhow, so I'm sure I'll uh, I'll blend yeah, in. Yeah, you're from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. You can find Carl Higby every Saturday on Newsmax. I'm also going to link his Twitter below. Uh, let me know what you thought. You know, like I said in the beginning, I'm a citizen. The majority of you watching are citizens. We're educated to a degree on military matters. I like history, but I don't know modern intricacies of war. I do know that what happened in Afghanistan was a mess up. Anyone with common sense knows that. But I learned a lot in this conversation, and I hope you did too. Comment down below what you thought, uh, and let me know who you want me to interview next. You know, I'm going to be doing a lot more regular shows soon. I'm sort of in the middle of building a studio here, uh, and we're going to be back hopefully weekly. So let me know who you want me to speak to next what your thoughts are on Carl Higby. And until next time, my name is Angelo Sidoro, and this is Cancel This.